Hello, um, my name, as I said previously, I'm uh, Dr. Jonathan Rao. I'm a associate assistant professor at University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And as we were kind of talking about getting organized for the talks uh, for, for the next couple of days, um, kind of kicked around the idea that we probably needed to start at a very basic level about what actually is game theory. Because I know we have a lot of people that are coming in from either a math mathematical background, some people are coming in from the biology, we have um, philosophy, all right, so we do have a little bit of uh, diversity in, in our particular trainings, and so we want to kind of give, make sure everyone had kind of a basic framework of what game theory actually was. Jonathan, yes? Do you have this uh, permission to get your slides? Uh, yes, I can absolutely. Yeah, so um, yeah, we'll, we'll take care of all that kind of in, in the break period, make sure everyone can get a copy. All right. So um, basically, game theory itself, you know, started out uh, from the economic side of thing, and, and basically our question is, you know, what is a game? Now, a game, as we kind of have from pop culture right now, we have a very famous or uh, very popular TV series, Game of Thrones. It's about strategy decision among a variety of players trying to amass power. We also have more traditional concepts of strategic games, such as chess. Uh, and game theory itself is basically predicated on how do we come up with the optimal or best type of strategy that I can play relative to other well-adapted individuals uh, who are trying to also play the game from different perspectives. So in a game, uh, basically the things that we want to try and look for uh, is that we are going to start out with a number of individual players um, and PI. And so each of these players are potentially distinct. Now, they may be identical, so it may be two players uh, in a ch game of chess, although actually um, white and black pieces because of the sequential nature are slightly different. But you have all your same basic options available for you, to you in terms of the way, say, uh, pieces might be moved across the board. In other situations, uh, you might be faced with something that's a little more ecological, uh, so you may have a predator and you may have a prey, so they'll have uh, different uh, sets of strategies about where to attack, where to hunt, where to hide, and the motivations of the individual players will also differ based on their particular role. Now, each of these players are going to be provided with a set of strategies that are unique to their particular uh, involvement in the game. and. Uh, I'll show you kind of the mathematics uh, very quickly in a moment. And here's one of the kind of the important things uh, about games is there's this assumption of public knowledge. So the goals that you have, the values that you have for various outcomes and resolutions of the game, I would know that as a player, you would know that as a player, everyone knows what everyone knows. So there's this, there's this no one has any hidden things going on and can't suddenly pull a strategy that uh, was not considered at the outset of the game. Uh, the games are played out and then as a result of the combinations of strategies that each of the players are doing, they'll wind up with some type of payoff. And so this is the thing where game theory is involved in maximizing this payoff uh, that's involved. Uh, strategies themselves are, and, and I put this in quotation marks, strategies are implemented from a s simultaneously. Now what this actually means is that the decisions uh, right at the very start of a game are set by the individual players themselves simultaneously. So it may be that they write down what I'm going to do, seal it in an envelope, and everyone puts their envelope on the table at the same time and then kind of does a reveal. Uh, it does, this does not preclude sequential actions, uh, but the simultaneity of the strategies themselves are they're initially set when the game is actually played. Uh, and uh, I'll discuss that in a little bit more detail in, in uh, just a little bit. Uh, finally, like I said, the goal is to maximize the, play, uh, the payoff for each individual pl uh, player given the responses and strategies of the other actors in the game. Now, from a math standpoint, uh, a way we can kind of think about a game is that it's simply a game is set up under those three basic uh, set of, um, of inputs. So we have our set of players P, all right, uh, each player individually has a set of strategies. Uh, so uh, player one might have two strategies available, player three might have four strategies, 
Uh, so there's no requirement that the strategies per player, uh, the number of options are uh, uniform across players. Uh, but if we take all of these and consider them essentially independent choices, uh, the combined strategies for the entire game are this nice little cross product. So all of my options versus all of yours in full combination and so forth. And so this is kind of the strategic or the strategies uh, that go into the basic definition of our game. Now for any particular gameplay, we'll, we're going to pull one element out of this long cross product. So everyone will have their strategy set in and then the payoff will be based on that particular uh, strategy that was played. So there'll be some rule for how to assess that payoff. Now, because we're trying to maximize everything, uh, one of the, the things, or the, uh, one of the main ideas that came out of game theory was the idea of the Nash equilibrium. And I will point out for those of you uh, here, uh, I've written strong, it actually should be strict. Uh, notice that slight typo here. Uh, strict Nash equilibrium, uh, given a particular game setup with all the strategies and payoffs available to our players. The Nash equilibrium is going to be a particular strategy combination such that no individual player may unilaterally change their strategy uh, without decreasing their payoff. So if here player I, he, he's looking at what's going on against all his peers, they're all playing their individual um, strategies at this equilibrium. And so if I go from my Nash equilibrium strategy here, uh, uh, SI pr uh, star, and I switch it to some alternate strategy, my payoff is going to be worse off. So uh, I cannot unilaterally change. And that's the important thing here. There's a slight variation of this definition. It's called the weak Nash equilibrium. And basically what it's saying is that you cannot independently improve. So that's a little bit of slight distinction here. The strict Nash has the strict inequality. Uh, the weak Nash is instead going to change it and it's going to have uh, bigger than or equal to. So it's, it's a non-unique, potentially non-unique optimum uh, relative to the strategies involved. But this is the basic idea of what you're trying to look for inside of a particular game structure. This is where things will kind of try and settle out. Now, the first type of game uh, that we're going to look at are what are known as sequential games. And these are the ones where individual players take turns making a decision. Uh, and so kind of the emphasis I want to make today is that the sequential nature of the game is in terms of the implementation of the strategies. The strategies are still going to be initially set, off, set at the start of the game, and then as each time you know, your turn comes around, you follow the script that you chose to begin with at the, start of the, at the start of the game. Now, uh, we also have a p an issue that uh, players may or may not know where they are during game play. Uh, they understand the full structure of a game. That part is still public knowledge and everyone has that available, but there may be something where uh, I stepped out of the room for a moment and I didn't realize, am I on my third, third round or is this my fourth round? something like that that was going on, or I forgot, I didn't catch what, what card uh, the player to my left played. So because I don't have uh, that ability to determine exactly where I am in all the potential uh, implementations of the game, we group those kind of simultaneous, or these areas where I can't quite distinguish where I am as an information set. All right, pure information uh, will know exactly where we are at all given times. Uh, but we may have something that uh, breaks down a little bit for us on that. Finally, uh, you, we have these uh, sequential games. At some point, there is a term and there's a terminal end to the game, at which point all accounts are settled uh, and our payoffs to each of our players will be provided there at the end. All right, so what this might look like. Um, these are most typically represented as a game tree. So you have this schematic diagram here. It's a nice branching diagram. And it goes from um, uh, a decision node, and you might have, two, in this particular case, everyone happens to have two choices at any given time, but, uh, or there might be more, but you'll be at a node, and one player will own this node. And so they will make all the determination about what will happen from that point forward. So here, for instance, player one might choose to go left or might choose to go right. At that point, there will be a second player uh, that gets an option. 
Now, in this particular diagram, uh, player two gets both of these options uh, once player one goes. This is not a requirement by any means. Uh, so I could have player one makes this decision, player two makes this decision, and then over here, uh, over here, this might be player four could have gotten this decision choice at that point. Uh, the very first node, uh, we call that the root of the tree. And then down here at the end, where I've kind of uh, marked off in gold, these are the terminal nodes. So this is where all the payoffs will actually happen. No individual player owns these things. This is just where the resolution of the particular path is going to happen. Um, players can appear multiple times at different levels within a particular branch. Uh, and the strategies themselves are, are going to be context dependent meaning your strategy that you start out before the game is played will simply say, when it comes my turn and if I am here, I will do this. I will say, if player two, I will go play up. Or if I'm over here, I will play back. All right, so I will have a preset context-dependent choice. And so here, player two, uh, in this context, he has choices up and down. In this, uh, over here, but in this other node that was assigned to player two, he has the choice to go back or forward, all right? Whereas uh, when it comes down to player three, player three has no idea what happened and what transpired prior to his uh, getting a chance to, to interact in the game. And as a consequence, this is the information set. Uh, player three not, is not able to make a determination about where he is, and his strategies are going to be the same, so red and blue in both instances. So one of the things that we look for in the information set is this inability to determine where we are in the hierarchy and the fact that all my uh, strategic options will be the same. All right, so this is kind of the, the, the classical uh, branching um, game tree uh, that we have. Now, within this game tree, uh, there's a couple of other concepts just to kind of bear in mind that you might sometimes see thrown around. Uh, the first one is the idea of a subgame. So a subgame is basically any subset of that tree diagram that we had, including all dependents and payoffs down at the end. So if we go back to the original uh, diagram that we had here, P2, I could set up, uh, and let's say that I ignored this uh, dashed line for a moment, because subgames, we don't, we don't like information sets as a general rule. All right, if I take all the points over here on the left, all these nodes, all right, that could be a subgame, all right, of the larger structure. And here would be a subgame, and here is a subgame. Now, if we have these subgames and, and we throw out the possibility of, of information sets, uh, there's a variation of the Nash equilibrium uh, called subgame perfect. And basically, your strategy is a Nash equilibrium not just for the larger structure, but for every smaller subunit of the game tree itself. Uh, not all Nash equilibrium are necessarily subgame uh, perfect, uh, but all subgame perfects are Nash equilibria. Uh, basically what this happens is there may be some wild scenarios that you will never actually realize in, in actual gameplay. So some, some parts where uh, one player won't do one thing, one player won't do another thing, and so there might be a, an entire branch of options that are not going to be available to us. And if that happens, then the strategies that you had for the individual context as part of that um, obsolete area of the tree, you could have bad strategy choices there, but because they never actually come up in actual gameplay, uh, they, wouldn't, they would not be suboptimal simply because they're not actually uh, involved. Now, uh, one of the famous problems of strategy uh, that we had was uh, mutually assured destruction, and it seems to be appropriate given current uh, global news between the United States and Russia. Uh, but mutually assured destruction was the idea that if you had uh, two players that had the ability to destroy one another, uh, um, the question was, should you launch a strike against your opponent? And uh, and achieve victory? Could you achieve victory? And the problem was that with most missile launches in, in that there would be, whoops, there would be a amount of warning uh, for, your, for the second player that they could counter strike if they so chose. So if I'm player one and it's my decision to, to whether or not to start the war, 
You know, I could simply say, no, I'm, not, I'm just going to hold off, and we pretty much stay exactly where we were. On the other hand, I could launch my strike, and player two, who's now sequential to me and can respond to that, could either say, okay, we're just going to accept it, uh, we'll take the full amount of destruction, and the other party claims victory, or I can launch a counter-strike, both of us will suffer destruction, and maybe there's some split of spoils uh, between the two of us as a result of a resolution, so it might be better. Now, if I look at this game and kind of think about, well, sub-game perfect, what, what am I going to do as a player? Well, if I'm player two, whoops, if I'm player two, if I get attacked, my best response is to counter-strike, all right? And because uh, player one understands that, that if they strike and I counter-strike, what they're going to compare in terms of their payoffs is V over two, half of victory minus my total destruction, versus the zero of just kind of where we are right now. Well, as this uh, goes on, that's, well, that's the idea about mutually assured destruction. If we have this probability, uh, we're always going to be never, the, uh, initi never to be the initiator in this problem. It's always better to be passive, provided uh, the stakes of destruction are, are much greater than what we have in victory. Now, in due course of time, we would have situations like first strike capabilities and uh, missile defense. And then that, all of a sudden that would come around and that would start m possibly changing the probability of obtaining a victory or mitigating the disaster. So if you had some shield defense uh, as player one, all of a sudden, well, okay, maybe that destruction's not so bad, my victory's a lot better, and the difference suddenly becomes maybe I can actually pull this off, suffer the hit, and I'll be better off than where I was previously. So this was kind of the, the big issue uh, in the 80s when we were talking about uh, coming up with uh, various uh, missile defenses or first strike capabilities uh, between the U.S. and Russia. Now, kind of a, a not a, s a different game, uh, kind of bringing this down. This is a, a game of co obtaining resources. Now, in this uh, context, we've got two animals. One's a large ape, the other's a small monkey, and they're going to be running up and down trying to get bananas out of a tree. Uh, so one individual, let's say the ape, has an option of climbing or waiting, all right? And the monkey will respond uh, and do the same thing after the ape makes a decision. Now, if they both go up and climb, uh, the ape will get five bananas, the monkey gets three. If the ape climbs, the monkey waits and the bananas fall down. He's going to pick up more on the ground. So payoff might be four and four. If the ape waits, uh, the monkey uh, will climb. Uh, so the ape gets nine of the bananas. The uh, monkey only gets one. And if they ne both wait, then they have this no payoff for either one. On the other hand, if we flip the order, the monkey goes first. Well, he still has the same options, but then the ape is contextually going to respond to the decision uh, of the monkey. And so the payoffs, these are the same thing. They're just kind of reversed order in terms of who went first um, in between these two. But because of this nature of which player goes first, there will be actually be an effect in terms of the gameplay because it comes into the issue of a credible threat. Now, what we had here with the mutually disturbed destruction uh, with that idea of, okay, I'm going to make, I'm going to give you a large cost, that was the threat that kept my uh, player one uh, maintaining into a passive state. But when I look here at this resource, well, the monkey, uh, if he goes first or if he goes second, he can't credibly use his uh, weight as a threat against the, the ape waiting because if n no one goes up, no one gets to eat. So if the ape waits and the monkey climbs, he's going to have to climb. All right, so the ape looks at this tree and says, okay, this will never happen. This, uh, the monkey will have to climb if I wait, and that's going to be a better payoff than if I climb and the monkey does either option. Whereas for the monkey, it's the same scenario. Because the ape's going second, he can't credibly threaten with his weight strategy because he'll still benefit by climbing. So in, in a game like this, whoever goes second uh, is going to have to do the climbing because the, the first person always will have the option to wait. Now we get back to that simultaneity. What if the monkey doesn't quite n realize what's going on yet or they have to actually uh, do this decision simultaneously to one another? Um, in that case, 
we get different types of scenarios. So when the ape chose first, the Nash equilibrium was ape weighted, monkey climbed. If monkey chose first, Nash equilibrium was for the uh, ape to climb and the monkey to wait. But when they choose simultaneously, all right, or without awareness of one another, then in addition to these, both of these are strategies, uh, Nash equilibria to this larger problem, but there's also what we call a mixed strategy. So 50% of the time I climb, 50% of the time I wait, and we just kind of randomize against one another. And in this particular problem, that is also uh, a viable strategy here. Now, the other type of game that uh, is most common in, in classical game theory is the normal form or matrix game. Okay, so this is, I have my array of uh, possible uh, strategies, you have an array of possible strategies, and we kind of look at everything in, in kind of a grid-like fashion. So here I have this kind of a diagram here. Uh, we have uh, a seller or, or a type of individual who is taking a couple of actions. He can bundle merchandise, divide it, modify it, or just treat things as is. The other person might be a stock trader or, or some type of trader, so he can buy, sell, or hold. And each of these three combinations uh, for player two and the, or player one and the four options for player two, they work together and, and we get all 12 poss possible outcomes within inside the game. Uh, and uh, the big thing with, game, with the Matrix games is the assumption is we really are going for this true simultaneity uh, that we, and, and without the uh, sequential actions that we saw with the games. Now, these can be with two players, they can be multiple players, so if you have multiple players, they stack up in, in arrays, and towards the end, I'll show you a game that, that does in fact involve three players, one or two examples of that. Uh, but the payoffs are, uh, in, whoops, payoffs are included here within um, the matrix, all right? And then so what happens is, as we try and find the Nash equilibrium, is that the players will try and compare their various strategies against what the opponent is doing. And they'll look and see, well, okay, are there some strategies that are just weak, uh, weak in comparison? So in this case, if we take the top player and we look at what's going on over here between his strategies of modify and as is, you, uh, he's going to look and say, okay, well, if the other guy is doing a buy option, okay, my modify is four, my as is is five. As is is better. And I go through uh, each line, I see, okay, well, if he's selling, I'm still better off doing as is. If he's holding, I'm better off doing as is. All right, so no matter what my opponent is doing, as is is simply better than modify. So what I do is I say, okay, even though modify is an option, uh, I'm throwing it out of my game completely. And so that goes away. And I just say, okay, this is not going to happen. And for some reason, that was originally on top, but, you know, um, all right, so, yeah, sometimes uh, layout doesn't always translate. So let's see. So this game is going to continue as this happens. And so player one has done, or player, top player has done this. And then we look at the side player, and he's going to do the same kind of thing. He's going to look at some of his options. Now, in this particular case, he's looking at the sell and hold options. And he'll notice that, okay, if I'm selling, okay, that beats hold here, that beats hold there, and, and what, 5 over 1, 12 over 5, 6 over 3. Sell is a better option, all right? So I throw that out, all right? So now, as the player on the side, I can only buy or sell. Top player bundles, divides, or as is. That's where we kind of r reduce the game down to. And so this entire process is known as iterated dominance. Now, one thing I'd like to point out is that if we started off with player, the side player making his decisions first, we see that here, 7 is less than 13, all right? So if we were just starting off from the side player's perspective first, he wouldn't have been able to make that determination of getting rid of this combination. Hold would still potentially have a benefit if the opponent played modify. But once the system goes into play and everyone starts reducing based off of what they know that the other person's going to do, then sell beats hold, and we have this reduced game as a result of that. Now, before we continue with this game, the big question is, do the Nash Equilibria actually always exist in every game? And if we are talking about pure strategy games, uh, the technically the answer is to that is no. They do not always ha games do not always have uh, Nash Equilibria among pure strategies. 
On the other hand, if we do allow uh, players to randomize, so like we had in the previous example with the ape and monkeys going up to uh, steal the banana, if they chose an option of 50%, 50%, and just kind of randomized against each other, that was a, a Nash equilibrium. And typically those are um, weak Nash rather than strong Nash. All right, so in something like here, if we kind of continue, what's happening then is that the strategy, instead of choosing option A, option B, option C, you're going to have a probability um, portfolio that says, okay, assign 50% to this option, 30% to this option, uh, and so forth uh, against all your things. So that's actually where you would wind up doing your strategizing is over those uh, percentages. So if we kind of return back to our problem here then, uh, we're going to look at dominance as a flow and kind of just say, okay, if uh, one player did a particular option and then I was allowed to counter that and, and we would kind of continue to counter so forth and so on, uh, we'll see if anything pops up. Now, if we start off with the seller in the, or the, the player on the right choosing sell and the player on the top choosing as is. We started here at this 6-4 payoff, all right? And let's see that one. Now, and that one actually should have flowed down on that one. Uh, but we have this um, option that as we go from, say, as is, we jump into over here into this divide option, so the buy divide. And then if uh, we're playing buy divide, the seller, uh, if the option to sell is better than buy. But if I chose buy, then the option to bundle is better than to divide. And then uh, the side player says, well, okay, well if you're bundling, then it's better for me to buy than sell. And so we get this cycle going on, all right? That's, this is an it instance where we're looking at uh, the flow of what's going on here. And because of that, we eventually, because of this as is part, um, both of these uh, here and ask will jump over uh, into this column over here, and we'll just kind of cycle around. And we look at that and say, okay, we don't have a, for this particular game, we don't have a pure Nash equilibrium. But because we have the cycling, we will have the um, mixed strategy that's somewhere in, bet in between. And so as an example, you know, we can uh, let uh, the proportion of, of buy and sell for player one and the portion uh, for bundling or versus dividing what you're going to look at is basically where the opposing player's decision is essentially nullified. All right, so all these uh, options here will have this, your payoff will simply be a weighted uh, probability uh, of, of doing one option or the other, and we'll look at the combinations where w if I'm doing my 50% of go for the banana or 50% weight, the other person doesn't matter what you do. All right, so e e each option is the same. And if you do 50-50, then my choice is essentially negated. So uh, these types of mixed strategies are kind of negating the choices of each individual by making all, po all potential uh, strategy payoffs essentially the same. Now, the last thing that I want to mention, uh, just kind of uh, going forward for kind of your classic games, the other type of game that you might see, uh, and this is particularly with these matrix games, is known as a perturbed game. And um, the idea here is really towards this, what we have down here at the bottom called the trembling hand perfect solution. And in this case, this is like if we went all the way back to, uh, jumping right here, we went all the way back to our mutually assured destruction, all right, and we've got the guy on the finger over the button, and he's like, okay, I'm not going to press this button. I'm gonna, we're we're, we're going to be passive. We're not going to do that. On the other hand, what if my hand's shaking and like, this is the fail safe and this is the launch code and I actually, whoops, okay, we just had a big, big problem. <laughs> All right, that's the trembling hand. How do you make sure that you avoid risk based on the solutions? So potentially within the set of strategies that you have, what you do is you say, okay, I have this series of uh, mixed strategies and the amount of error that I make is, is progressively smaller. So I start with maybe a big, large amount of error and then I make my epsilon delta or my epsilon go down to, to uh, zero. And in that sequence of, of games as we kind of say, or, or as this is going on, uh, if there's a strategy, a Nash equilibrium that kind of emerges as the, as the, um, 
as the solution from each of these perturbed games, that's our trembling hand perfect. So if there's a set of bad risk over here and low payoff but not too bad over here, the trembling hand will kind of put me over here. I, if I look at each of the games of like what's the worst case scenario if, if I am not smart in playing my game and my opponent is not smart, the risk aversion will come in. And so we kind of, you know, this is where we get into from biology and evolution. This is our uh, trade-offs. You know, do you go high risk, high reward, or do you go for something that's regular or smaller? Regular, uh, you know, something that, that has less variance, that's our trembling hand, perfect concept in biology. Now, uh, the last little bit that I want to do with kind of the classic games is just kind of give you an example of some of the types of games that you would see. So the first one is just a match game. So we have two players that are essentially the same. Uh, so um, it's a couple. They want to decide what they want to do. So they can either go out for the evening or they can stay at home. And the important thing is they want whatever they decide, they want to decide on the same thing. Because if one party wants to go out, the other one wants to stay home, the net result is they'll just kind of fight over the evening. So we have a, a slight uh, payoff here. So if you both go out and enjoy the evening, okay, you get a rating of everyone gets a two. If you fight uh, because you disagreed on your choice, uh, everyone got a minus one for the evening. And if you stayed at home, well, you still benefited. All right, so this was still, still a very nice uh, evening. Now within this game, and if we had actually done the flow diagrams, uh, stay, if I were a top player and my, and my partner was doing go, my option would be to uh, choose go. Similarly, if my partner is choosing go and I'm here on the side, uh, my option is, is to switch from stay to go. So we would see that this corner, the bottom left and the top right, would flow into the top uh, left box. Similarly though, if I looked at stay, well, it's also equally likely that if my side partner uh, has the option of switching and I'm saying let's stay, they could stay as well. All right, and here and here. So we have two solutions. The flow diagrams are going to these two opposite extremes. And we have two Nash equilibria in these games. Go, go, and stay, stay. All right, and these are still happy solutions. Uh, even though go, go is clearly better than stay, stay, that in and of itself is, doesn't mean that we'll just collectively jump from here to here. Because the choice of the individuals is that you have to make your change of strategy, your, your, your change uh, in, in your choices, independent of what the other person is doing. Because you have to treat them as simply they are fixed and immovable in what they have decided to do. All right. Uh, the other game, uh, Love and Hate. So we have two players. Uh, one player, uh, which is player one, they want to match the emotion of player two. All right. So if, if you're... Uh, exhibiting love, some type of positive emotion, I want to match that. If you're having a bad day, being terrible, I'm going to have a bad day and be terrible too because I just want to be just like you. We, whatever you feel, I want to feel the same thing. The other player wants to be contrarian. All right? If you're having a good day, that makes me miserable. If you're miserable, I want to come over there and give you all these hugs. And so there's this complete opposite uh, uh, of attitude here. So we have one player who wants to match the other player who wants to differ. And in a game like this, there's no pure strat, there's no Nash equilibrium to the, to the problem. All right, if I'm loving, my other, m the other party goes to hate and he's hating, I'm gonna match that. Well, he's gonna switch right back and we get this constant cycling going on. All right, but if we look at randomizing over our strategies, well, if I, half the time I love, half the time I hate, all right, this would be a solution here, okay? It would balance things out. It wouldn't matter if the other person was hating or loving at any given time. If we play these strat strategies frequently, um, the 50-50 would work overall. Now, the 50-50 that I have here is a little bit of an artifact of the actual payoffs that I've put in here. So I do want to say that, you know, if we change these from one and minus one, um, we could tend to uh, move these percentages around a little bit. But for illustration, 50-50 is what we have. Now, the next game, let's see, whoops, there we go. This is the famous one. You're going to be hearing a lot about this one over the next three days. This is the prisoner's dilemma. Now, in the prisoner's dilemma, you've got basically two, convict or, uh, two criminals that have been um, arrested on suspicion of a particular crime. And they're put off into separate rooms, and they're being asked 
whether or not are you going to confess to this crime or not. And if you confess, uh, we're going to go easy on you and we're going to put all the, the prison time on the other guy. That's kind of the idea. Uh, and if, you, if both of you kind of cooperate, and cooperate means with your partner in crime, if you cooperate, both of you um, can you stay silent, you don't, conf you don't talk to the cops, you'll get out because uh, with maybe a slight misdemeanor and you get all your ill-gotten gains. So you've got the loot hidden someplace, you'll be able to get it and you can split it up. On the other hand, if you rat out the other guy, all right, he's going to go to jail and I'm going to get a, a very reduced sentence and I'm going to get all the money that I can find or, or someplace else. So it might be in my interest to defect, all right? The only problem is, is that this is essentially a symmetric game. It, if my partner is, is cooperating and he's not being uh, talking to the cops, if I rat him out, well, that's in my interest, but it's also in his interest to rat me out. And if I'm ratting you out or you're ratting me out, then the best response, or potentially the best response, if we both rat out each other, is we do a different um, level of, of prison time. And the dilemma arises when the payoff for defection is better than the reward for the cooperation, which is uh, bigger than the, the time that you do if you both confess which is still greater still than being sold down the river by your partner. Yes? Right, so it um, depends on the textbook that you t tend to read these things in. Usually um, um, P would be like a negative number, so you're, like, you're going in for 10 years, or, or S T would be 10 years, P would be 5 years, or negative 5 is how we would score it numerically. Right, but the main thing is that if I'm looking at it in, in terms of however I've scaled money versus prison time, if, if, if the payoff in combination of those, all those things that would happen, um, if we have this particular sequence of payoff values, that's where the dilemma happens because that's when it's always better, no matter what, my other per what the other person is doing, it is always better to defect, confess. Uh, and then so as a result, the Nash equilibrium is defect, defect. All right, so everyone confesses to the cop. We get slightly reduced sentences, but no one got any re payoff reward from the stolen money. And no, this is uh, going to be a, a strict Nash equilibrium because it is a clearly, superi clearly superior strategy. Uh, and kind of a, from a philosophical standpoint, this is the core uh, problem that's kind of that lurks in the background of any s games of, of signaling honesty. All right. There's a potential for the signaler to be dishonest, and do I want to? And then the other party has a slight different variation of that uh, choices. You know, his choices would be believe or, or disbelieve, but they're the same type of of action, and we'll see it a little bit later. I think that the, there's this drive towards um, eliminating honest communication and and credibility among potential audience members. All right. The other uh, very famous game that you see all the time with game theory is our hawk-dove game. All right, in the hawk-dove game, there's, uh, you're characterized by your level of aggression towards one another. Uh, so if you're very aggressive, that's a hawk. If you're very passive, uh, that's a dove. Uh, it's also known as game of chicken or snowdrift. Now, b uh, what's happening is there's some food item or reward item uh, that the two of you are, two, two players are going to compete over. And if uh, it's two doves that are competing against one another, well, they'll be very nice and meek and equally share the resource. But if a hawk encounters a dove, what will happen is that the hawk's aggression will scare off the dove. So the hawk gets all the reward, and the dove has to go off and whatever he can pick up in the background. The problem is, is that what happens when a hawk versus a hawk happens, all right? They're going to... Um, because they're being both being very aggressive, neither one's going to back down. There's going to be a costly conflict as a result of what's going on uh, in that interaction. So half the time you're going to get the reward, half the time you're going to get scrapped up. All right. So the the payoff is suddenly much reduced. All right. And as a result, the Nat the Nash equilibrium structure of this game is going to be somewhat dependent on the relative value of the object versus the cost and risk uh, assumed in, in a conflict. If uh, the if V is going to be bigger than C, the value 
should always be a hawk because if you're faced with a dove, we'll always be hawkish. But if uh, I'm faced with a hawk, all right, in this case, uh, it should still be beneficial to be a hawk. On the other hand, if the value, isn't, uh, value of the object is not that great or the cost is, is quite substantial, then the problem is, is that if I'm facing a, a dove, I should still go to hawk or in either of these two options. But if I'm facing a hawk, because of the cost of the conflict, it's better off to be a dove, to run away, live another day. So what happens in that situation is that you have a strategy where one player chooses hawk, the other chooses dove, uh, and it could be in either order. Both of those are correct strategies for this game. All right. All right. So to kind of conclude on our little bit of uh, game theory here, from classic game theory anyway, uh, our non-matrix games or, or some other ideas about what could be going on. There are games of intensity that are out there, so these include auction bids, how much in effort are you willing to put in to overcome someone else. Uh, it doesn't quite fit in within our matrix game. Uh, we could have things that are group involvement, so I've got two examples up here. One is the mammoth hunt, also called a stag hunt, where uh, you could either stay in the village and work on uh, some basic agriculture, or, so it's minimal resource but also minimal risk, or you can join the hunting party, and uh, the hunting party goes out. If there's enough hunters involved, they'll be successful. They'll bring in uh, a large amount of meat uh, for the tribe to, to eat off of, and everyone uh, eats equally off of whatever has been obtained by the, by the group. The problem is, is that if you go out on the hunt, there's a risk. All right? Somebody's going to get gored uh, by the stag or get trampled by your, by your mammoth as you're out hunting. Uh, and because of that risk, and it's being e equally spread among hunters, there's this situation of uh, if there's enough hunters already going, stay at home because you're going to get your share of meat. There's enough, there's enough uh, people involved that the stag hunt or the mammoth hunt will be successful. So if I can say, okay, I'm going to get that share of the reward, but I'm not going to accept any of the risk, all right, that's, uh, the, that's our cooperate or defect concept in, in kind of a mass game. All right. And so the problem is, is that what happens is that the number of people that are willing to be involved in, in the hunt will go down to the bare minimum. Uh, it potentially it could also, and if the value of, of the hunt is less than uh, the cost of, of the injury, then potentially no one will go uh, hunting. Everyone will stay in, in a sedentary environment uh, doing whatever they can do locally. Uh, another version uh, that we see with, with mass games, uh, Tragedy of the Commons. Uh, so this is, we have a common fishing area or some other type of resource, and everyone's trying to optimize their individual payoff uh, relative to everyone else. And so kind of what happens is, is that the amount of intensity that you put in or, or the amount of uh, time that you put into, say, the fishing versus doing something else where you could get some kind of background payoff uh, is potentially worse uh, from the collective perspective of what's the net total benefit for everyone involved in the community. All right. So if you're individually maximizing, that's not the same thing as what sometimes called the social optimum, uh, which is someone who would say, okay, only 20% of people get to go fish, the rest of you have to go do something else. The net benefit for the population as a whole is, is better. That's the central planner perspective. Uh, the other way that you could also think about it is sometimes tragedy of commons can be averted by uh, a division of the resource. So everyone has uh, designated individual sites and patches. So there's individual ownership. Uh, and that can also avert the tragedy because you don't have this conflict within the individual patches. All right. Um, the other thing that you might see that I did not include here uh, that I think you might um, hear about this weekend uh, or this week is uh, repeated games. So what happens if you play the game over and over again? Do I remember what you did and do I have strategies to enforce you to do a particular strategy on giving games? So with the uh, prisoner's dilemma and, uh, and games like that, you might hear strategies called tit for tat, um, which is basically I will do whatever you did to me last time around we played. And there are other ways of, okay, how many times do I have to punish you before you do the do the right thing and then we'll cooperate again based off of, off of that. So those are all different ways in which games get extended beyond the matrix or beyond the tree. 
Now, for the last um, 25 minutes or so that we're going to be talking here, I'm going to try and put game theory in some biological context. So we've had a lot of econ classic theory here. Um, basically, you know, from the economics perspective, we always kind of assume this uh, rational actor who's able to evaluate everything. Uh, the individuals are strategizing, uh, and the payoffs are typically financial or resource-based uh, in nature. Um, and our goal has typically been kind of put in the perspective of finding Nash equilibrium. All right. Uh, from the biology side, you know, there's this general rejection of uh, trying to anthropomorphize uh, the animals. We don't typically, and, and I, I'll put that in quotation marks depending on which journal article we're reading. They're not rationally thinking about uh, what's going on in the environment. And so instead, what uh, the idea is basically is that the individuals have fixed character characteristics. Their strategy is who they are as, a, as an individual. They cannot change. And so that's called their trait, or sometimes it's called their morph, uh, real common uh, in the literature. Uh, they don't randomize what they're doing, but the population, if you treat the population as a whole, can, can have, say, 50% um, red tails, 50% blue tails, that's a randomization of morphs, all right? And if, if the population kind of as a whole then, um, that 50-50 is kind of the equivalent of what was a, uh, a mixed strategy among rational uh, players in a, in a traditional game. Uh, the other thing is that the payoff is typically going to be biological in nature, so it's either going to be uh, resource items or more likely, and, and a lot of times uh, it's going to be reproductive success. So how many offspring do you ultimately contribute into the next generation. All right, and instead of finding a Nash solution, we're trying to find an uh, evolutionarily stable strategy, uh, shorthanded as an ESS, which simply means that if the entire population is doing this one thing, uh, no novel mutant can come in and disrupt things. The, the novel mutant will be um, um, worse off relative to the fact that it is rare. All right, so it doesn't mean that the novel mutant an entire population of novel mutants couldn't uh, be better than a population of your wild type. It's just that if you have that one individual mutant, he's going to pair for uh, he will uh, fare poorly relative to the to the basic population at that time. All right. Uh, let's see. So, how do we kind of take these ideas then and put them into what we want for biology? And this is where we get into a, a relatively more recent area. Uh, 20 years or 20, 30 years at this point now. Uh, this is evolutionary game theory, all right? And so the games are being played out among large populations where the individuals aren't necessarily influencing the, the current behavior of the population. Uh, so this is the mutant versus the, the standard of the population right now. So what we have is this individual, um, he's going to have some of his mutant strategy, and he's going to compare it against whatever's currently dominant within the population as a whole. All right? The population will shift if the, not, if the mutant can invade based on its being rare. All right? If the, if the individual mutant uh, is, is relatively poor, uh, then the, the mutation is lost out of the population. Now, a couple of words that will get thrown around between the biology and the math. If you evolution over time, um, th that's simply going to be our change of trait frequencies in these particular problems. And so math-wise, we have some state variables representing that frequency, and it's just changing based off of some particular fitness function. It says go up, go down. And in this particular case, I'm, I'll be using a differential equation uh, perspective. Uh, genetic drift uh, is simply there's noise attached to this fitness. So if you take the fitness, subtract off its mean over time, uh, then that would be the noise. Uh, most models that we d uh, that you see in the literature, they don't do well. I, I won't say most, but uh, kind of traditionally, the genetic drift does not come into into play with some of these models necessarily. Uh, they'll come into play with, with some other types of of, of situations. Uh, positive selection means there's one preferred trait frequency to go to. Um, negative selection goes in the opposite, so this e expectation of the fitness is either positive or negative. Uh, you'll see a couple of terms, monomorphic populations. These are basically your population is entirely composed of a single trait, whereas polymorphic 
Uh, they will have multiple individuals, uh, or, or they will have multiple traits involved. So frequencies will be between zero and one. All right, and um, for any model to be bi biologically plausible, this is something we as mathematicians need to be a little more mindful of. Biologists get this. We don't. Mathematicians don't always pick up on this, but we have to really just consider our uh, cases where, for instance, frequencies are non-negative, uh, and sum of probabilities go to one. Um, th there are interesting things out there once we break the rules from a math perspective, but they're not meaningful. Uh, so uh, we'll refer to that as biological plausibility. Now, if we look at our hawk dove, and I'm going to kind of come back to the hawk dove repeatedly to kind of illustrate how this translates, uh, we have our situation just like we had previously where the hawk was stronger, all right? And if the, the value of the resource um, um, was less, then there's, two, there's the mixed strategy as well as the two hawk versus dove or dove versus hawk playoffs, all right? Uh, we're going to convert these uh, by looking for, uh, let's see, I actually should have had this a little bit earlier. Um, We've got three types of equilibria to look at. The first one is our Nash equilibria that we had from classical um, game theory, which simply says don't, you can't improve by changing yourself. The evolutionarily stable strategy is that the mutant is always going to uh, be less than the resident population doing something. Or if it is equally fit, then the resident type can counter invade the mutants. All right, so. This is kind of the strong ESS, you're the dominant one, and then you can have the possibility of, okay, you're doing okay, but I, if you get too big, I can counter invade you. Then we get to a final and often confused type of dynamic called the evolutionarily stable state. And this is a little bit more kind of what I'm going to be looking at uh, in, in, in some ways with some of the discussion I'm going to talk about here. This is about the genetic or more frequency uh, that's going on. Uh, Unlike these, which are a little bit more pure games going on, this is about dynamics. So this is the same uh, dynamic stability that you would have in an ODE model, where we're simply trying to figure out, is this a stable node, unstable node? That, uh, you're looking at the evolutionarily stable state, looking at the payoffs that are going on there. Uh, these are treated, uh, this is uh, just some discrete replicators. So one way that we can think about how um, we take these payoffs or these values of fitness. Uh, we can treat them as either discrete time, generational events, or we can go continuous time. So in discrete time, uh, we have a particular frequency and it has a fitness. Uh, in this case, I've switched over to a more traditional W, uh, fitness weight, all right? It, your fitness for your particular type of, of trait relative to the average fitness within the entire population, which is determined here, uh, if that's positive, then you will grow in frequency within the population. If, that's, if you're less than the average fitness within the population, you'll decrease. All right. Uh, the fitness will kind of continue, and so the equilibrium condition is that uh, all the remaining, the fitnesses of all the remaining traits that are actually out there will uh, be equal to the average fitness. Now, this may be one uh, maybe a uh, single trait, maybe multiple traits composed here. Uh, we would also like to point out for my biology uh, individuals, this is simply the haploid version of the Hardy-Weinberg law uh, for frequencies of uh, what's the probability of an allele, or what's the frequency of an allele in the next generation based off of fitness. So it's all, it, it does all kind of tie in back together there. Now, uh, a little bit more getting back to um, where I was heading for, our continuous replicator dynamics. Um, the, again, X is going to be the frequency of the trait within the population. Here, uh, what we have is that the, the rate of change of one trait over another trait is going to be equal to the difference in their fitness. And this is actually an important distinction between scoring uh, in a continuous game versus a discrete game. In discrete games, the payoffs must be strictly non-negative. Actually, they have to be strictly positive. Um, um, well, non-negative, non um, whereas here in continuous games, because we're going to be based off of differences of fitnesses, we can score things positive or negative. It, that's fine. Uh, whereas if you had negative fitness, like uh, say minus D from being blown up in our mutually assured destruction game, uh, that doesn't work in the discrete case uh, for modeling purposes. All right, so this, uh, if we actually break it down and say there were two, two uh, traits going on, X 
x1 and x2, and I'll just kind of drop the subscript here. This is x1 or, or not. Uh, this is its frequency is going to be equal to its the it's going to be proportional to the difference in in fitness weights, and then it's going to be multiplied by the variance in the population of the trait. So this x times 1 minus x, this is the trait variance. It's also the frequency of encounter between different uh, trait individuals. All right, and if we have multiple uh, traits going on, then we simply do uh, a multiple vari uh, a variation of this where it's going to be a summation of uh, fitness differences times the encounter rates uh, between the different morphs. Now from this, if we go back to our Hawk diagram, uh, we take the, the average the, or the expected payoffs uh, based off of that game, and then we convert that into our replicator dynamic equation. So in a particular case, uh, if we were looking at, at the Hawk dove, you had the option of Hawk being a Hawk versus being a dove uh, relative to, say, facing another Hawk. All right. Well, half the time I would get V minus C if I were playing Hawk, and I would subtract from that the zero that I had from playing a dove. Whereas if I faced a dove, which, which, was, which would occur at frequency 1 minus x, all right, uh, my option, if I, if I play hawk, I'd get a full v. If I play dove, I get a half of v. The difference between those two options is uh, v minus half of v, so this is a half of v here. And I can kind of shorten things up just a little bit, consolidating that equation. Now what happens is that we can see in our scenarios that when the value was particularly great, all right, um, the dynamics of V minus CX, this was always going to be positive. So there is a direct uh, positive selection for uh, being hawkish in this, in this encounter. On the other hand, if V is less than C, then all of a sudden, if you face other hawks, go dovish. If you face doves, go hawkish. All right, we have this, the stability is here at this polymorphic state where there is some hawks, some doves in the population. It's not everyone's being the same thing. All right. Now we have some other types of selections that might uh, pop up. So um, in this particular case, you'll notice that it is in fact frequency dependent, the V minus CX. Uh, so there may be some type of frequency dependence going on. It might be directional. So kind of again, one trait being strictly better than the other, which we saw when uh, V was bigger than C. Uh, occasionally you might see some other terms that pop up, balancing selection, uh, rare traits are being favored, so there's uh, some positive, at least at the end, some, some means of supporting uh, novel invasions. Stabilizing will kind of reduce genetic diversity, does not necessarily mean uh, that it favors one or the other, uh, but we could also have, <coughs> excuse me, um, a disruptive selection which uh, kind of uh, favors or, or selects against um, intermediate um, types of forms or populations. All right. So what happens with these continuous replicators? Well, okay, we have our monomorphic populations, and in this particular diagram, what you're actually looking at is a, is a uh, three-player game that got turned into replicator dynamics. This is about um, males uh, offering territorial calls for females, and there are sneaker males around in the area. So just a, some quick background on this. And what happens is the males are having to choose between whether or not to actually be actively uh, calling for females or if they actually want to set up traps to beat sneaker males that are coming into their territory. And as a result, you get different behaviors. So you get cycling where, fem whoops, where females are coming in, uh, or let's see, in this case, there's sneaker males trying to come in, steal females, and females always come in and uh, the ma territorial males are basically uh, uh, attacking anyone who comes in. You have other situations where uh, the territorial males are attacking whoever comes in, but the sneaker males are, are always coming in versus the females always coming in, and so the females are adjusting their frequency. So those things can happen as we look in these types of models. Uh, another type of three uh, three player game, uh, rock, paper, scissors. Uh, we have um, the Anolis lizards. They have different, males have different uh, territorial uh, strategies. So some can be territorial. They sit on piles of rocks uh, claiming territories. S uh, some males are helper males. They, they kind of are, are a non-threatening group that come in and assist with upkeep of area. And in the process, they kind of sneak copulations in that way. 
Uh, you also have raider males. They are non-territorial. They just kind of come in, zoom in for a copulation real quick, and, and then leave. All right, so all these three types of uh, strategies are available, and we can look at a game uh, just as an example of how one strategy versus another goes. And because it's a kind of a rock, paper, scissors game, uh, one type helpers beat territorial males uh, who beat raiders who beat helpers. And, and uh, it's, it's actually like a documented, it's like a six-year cycle uh, between the different morphs. Uh, one will be in dominance, then they'll slowly start in an invasion, and then two years later, it'll switch down to the next type of dominant male, or next type of most successful male. And we could look at it, and we'd get a cycling behavior going on. Uh, we could also look at things like a truth game. Uh, so you could be truthful, and if the person's believing you, well, the believer uh, gets a win. If uh, they disbelieve you, well, I win. So this is kind of like saying, hey, there is a predator out here. So this is kind of put in, there's a food item that's sitting out here, and I could say, hey, there's a predator. So if you believe me, okay, you avoid getting eaten. If you disbelieve me, well, I get to laugh at you for having been eaten, something like that. Or the predator comes in, eats you, and then I come back to the area and get the resources that you thought were there. On the other hand, I could deceive you. Uh, and this is real common with um, sentinel birds. They'll give out calls uh, to kind of scare away during uh, rivals during aerial tumbles. So they'll be looking and trying to grab a hold of um, bugs and whatnot, and they'll say, oh, no, there's a predator with a, with a, with a scream. And so they'll be coming in, and one party, the other party will just kind of fly away at a certain level. So there's a, if I deceive you, I'm going to get a benefit from you credibly believing what I was saying was going on. And then if I'm trying to deceive you and you don't believe me, chances are you're going to benefit. It's kind of what's going on. So we just kind of look at what's the differential, payoff differential of belief or non-belief or being truthful versus deceptive. And it's really just a strict payoff difference uh, between your two options given the, what's going on there. And again, we work out similar types of equations. So one for frequency of belief, one for the frequency of honesty, and uh, go through the particular problems that we would have there. And uh, depending on uh, what's going on, we can get different dynamics. So you could have one situation where we just uh, kind of get some signaling. You can get another situation, which is the more common ethological problem of, you know, if it pays to be dishonest, uh, that's going to collapse the system, so everything's going to come down to a no-belief, no-honesty scenario. Otherwise, it, it, it'll probably uh, cycle uh, a little bit in these types of problems. Uh, some other types of things that you might see, uh, this is Uka, uh, he's a fiddler crab, and what they do is they wave uh, in territorial displays to claim areas, and uh, during life, the fiddler crabs uh, can sometimes <laughs> lose their arm, and they'll regrow them back, and they can actually grow them to be very much larger than they were even previously, but they're weaker. The, the, the muscle tissue is not as strong within the new, new form claw. So you have these um, individuals that are out there, and what they do is they kind of claim a little spot of, of sand on the beach, and they'll wave, and they'll do this to uh, attract females, but they also do it to scare off territorial males uh, that had come in. And so the males that are coming into the area have kind of have to decide, am I going to fight for the territory, or am I going to lose? And again, there's potential for escalations based on size. So if we have two potential signalers, all right? We have big signalers and small signalers, and these would be the ones with the weak claws, all right? And I actually, I think this is where this one was coming in from. Uh, uh, so in this particular case, um, if you respect, that means you, you take the threat credible that this uh, territorial holder can actually back it up and is strong. Uh, and so I'll just take some background uh, fitness. Otherwise, I can challenge for a fight. And there's various rules for, you know, how much uh, it's going to go in involved here. Now, the difference is, is that I, as a challenger, I could be a, a small person or a big person. And we have this, for, for simultaneous purposes, you can kind of think of if there's uh, a territorial male who's, who's big and fighting, there's a, another big male who's coming in, there's a small male that sees this conflict going on, uh, so he's kind of like, uh, he's just going to uh, kind of run away and, and just take whatever's in the background here. But we go through all of these things, uh, we get similar dynamics of uh, some, some males, um, you can have scenarios where you have a, a degree of, 
of big territorial holders, small territorial holders, and uh, the big guys could avoid co challenging conflict, whereas the little guys might feel plucky enough to strike. Whereas on the other hand, uh, the same dynamics, starting from a different uh, position within the cube, uh, we wind up with a scenario where um, the big guys will always challenge and the small guys will, will, will kind of not challenge for position in the territory. So uh, the outcome is, uh, is initial condition dependent. Uh, we can also, kind of the last little thing to mention, and it's kind of good, about five minutes remaining, uh, sexual selection. Uh, so uh, again, just some quick terms that we might see, monogamy, um, you know, you're just mating with a single individual, polygamy, um, multiple individuals, and specifically the one that you see most common is polygyny. So one male has uh, mates with multiple females inside of a population. Occasionally you might see polyandry, which is one female with multiple males. All right. Uh, the sexual selection, uh, we're going to be looking, this, the selection can happen at different moments. So there can be a sort of mating, whether or not you even entertain in an encounter w with a particular member of the opposite sex. Uh, there, this can be uh, shaped by preferences for individual traits that one or the other has. And then uh, there can things that can be go on before the copulation or the things that can happen after copulation or during fertilization. Uh, one of the more interesting ones, cryptic uh, sexual selection. Um, there are various aspects uh, within uh, some species um, uh, mating canals. They can kind of store eggs or sperm in one location. Uh, and there's some controls that are not directly observable that they can use to, to uh, preference uh, the sperm contribution from one male versus another. So all these things are, are possible ways in which sexual selection can be going on. All right. Um, now, female preferences um, can, it, it's kind of been well established that females can have preferences for male traits. Uh, it can be for arbitrary traits, or it could also be for traits that are actually tied to the fitness of the male. Uh, and so, uh, without, since we kind of close to time, uh, I'll basically kind of, the capstone is, is that females are perfectly valid in, in traditional um, uh, evolutionary analysis. Females can have traits for uh, either arbitrary traits or for traits that confer some degree of fitness, um, primarily because the assumption in all these base models is that females are all equally uh, reproductively fit and they will all be mated at some point within uh, the particular cycle. Males, on the other hand, aren't quite the same way. So uh, let's see, just kind of jumping over for a moment for males. Uh, the males, uh, the traditional assumption was, again, all females were reproductively fit, but if males had a preference for one female trait or another, what would happen is that uh, the idea was that males would simply bypass reproductive opportunities in search of a preferred female. All right? And if that were true, then because of those lost opportunities of, of potential mates that you run into, you're technically less fit uh, in that context. And so uh, what we... Uh, Dr. Maria Cervetio and I did a couple of years ago, we took this same basic idea and, and we said, okay, well what happens if there's actually a, a, an additional game going on where the males who have preferences are because they're over essentially overcrowding a resource, the males who don't have preferences say, okay, uh, these females are, are highly sought after, uh, go after a slightly less uh, desired female uh, within the population, and if we do that, you're essentially going back to the idea of kind of an ideal free distribution. You're separating yourselves out among patches, as it were, and as a result, kind of looking at all that, we, we went through everything that was going on here, doing the same types of take, it started out as a basic matrix game of payoffs or a frequency-based uh, payoff. We come into these, our replicator equations, and we do see that the males with preferences, they take a small hit initially, but once the assortment uh, of males with biases and those without uh, preferences, they'll set up and they actually go into a very nice uh, sexual assortment, uh, of which is, and so it can actually rapidly facilitate uh, speciation, much more so than female preference uh, actually would. Uh, and we could take this, uh, problem that we had, it's the same problem, but then we looked at, okay, because most of these models were haploid, what happens if we actually incorporated genetics? So you're actually carrying both uh, the trait as well as preference genes, 
And we could actually uh, looked at that, and we do get very strong uh, linkage disequilibrium uh, between, uh, between preference and trait. So th this was excellent. We looked at the, pro the problem from multiple dynamic uh, levels. All right, so here we are at our, our, our last couple of minutes here. Just as a conclusion, uh, we've been able to go through and look at game theory. It's our means of understanding how to make strategies in different contexts. Uh, then we have uh, the thing that we were traditionally after in game theory was the Nash equilibrium, which was no, no one could independently deviate from that strategy without um, doing worse. But we could also use this to, to go into game theory. Um, and so some of the things that we looked at, uh, particularly from the dynamic side of things, are the replicator dynamics. These can be both discrete and continuous in nature. Uh, and we're basically looking at the fitness of each potential morph that's within the population and then we can uh, use the replicator equations to assess how is the frequency uh, of these uh, various possible traits changing over time within the population. Uh, and then um, once we have that idea down of how do we take game theory, apply it into biology through these equations, then all of a sudden uh, we can ap start applying them to a variety of different dynamics, uh, including um, territorial calls, um, si honest signaling, um, uh, mate, mating and mating preferences. So with that, that comes to an end on our talk. I hope you guys have enjoyed this kind of introduction into game theory and how it sometimes and how it points into what we can do in biology a little bit. <laughs>